Believe it or not, when I first saw The Parent Trap as a kid, no, not that one, that one. Surprise! I was blown away when I learned that these two girls weren't actually twins, and that they were both played by Haley Mills. It's likely that many of you felt the same way when you discovered that Army Hammer didn't really have a twin in the social network. No, no, there's no way. That was amazing how that was done. Just wrote the damn boat. Filmmakers have been fooling audiences with this effect since the beginning of cinema. Because the techniques and innovations behind this effect have evolved as audiences have grown more sophisticated. But regardless of whether or not a filmmaker is trying to fool anyone, ah! this easily has to be one of the most common visual effects there is. Two of them? You're just one of us. Huh. Just one! Must be seeing things. Yo, can you tell? Are you me? You. I'm not you. You're me. Me, me, me. This video is going to break down the evolution of this effect. So here we go. Here's how filmmakers have captured the same actor on screen with themselves at the same time. This is Creating Doubles, the split screen and beyond. Now before we dive into the technical aspect, some of you might be wondering, why not just cast actual twins? Well, in several instances, filmmakers still do cast twins. Hello, President Screw. It just so happens that Linda Hamilton has an identical twin, featured here in Terminator 2. There's a part where there are two Sarah Connors, so I suggested to them that they use my sister cool. instead of doing the process work. Yeah. The security guards are also twins. With that being said, since most actors don't have an identical twin, let's quickly talk about dual roles. Now, in several cases, many dual roles don't specifically require the actor to be on screen with themselves. And I just saw myself doing that character. <laughs> but for whatever reason, having the same actor playing multiple characters is a deeply impactful storytelling device. Just think how different The Wizard of Oz would have been if the Scarecrow, the Tin Man, and the Lion hadn't also been played by the farmhands in Kansas. And you were there, and you were there, and you were there. And you were there. Without these recurring faces and characters, the story wouldn't have the same emotional impact. You'll find that actors often play dual roles in stories about duality. You're the enemy within. The most obvious example would be Jekyll and Hyde. The basis of the whole story is seeing one actor physically change from one character Mr. Buddy Love. into another. And with that, actors from time to time have to confront themselves. I'm badass. And you're good at it. It was very scary for me to play both the hero and the villain. Actors also often play dual roles in comedy. Bogus. Good lord. I've heard about this cat juggling. From Peter Sellers in Doctor Strange Love. Uh, 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 mm. To Eddie Murphy. I'm Eddie Murphy. Excuse me. Hey, it's Kunta Kinte! <laughs> yeah, pretty much any Eddie Murphy or Mike Myers movie. I've farted. How you doing, Dad? Shut it! Dual roles within this genre usually implies that nobody is trying to fool anyone with the effect. And that the laughs come from the audience being in on the joke. And watching these actors just do their thing. Wait a second. Wait a second. The design is based on Rick's father-in-law. I actually used him to double the, the guy. He's in a couple of shots. Aha! Aha! Now, should the actor need to be on screen with themselves, the most common way to do it, without any visual effects, is to use a body double. He uses a double. No, 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 no. It's too simple. This is a complex illusion. The only way that I know how to do it is to find you a bloody good double. Doubles are an essential element to creating this illusion that's very effective and still used to this day. A double is typically used to play opposite the actor in any shots that are filmed from behind or over the shoulder. I'm probably Jack farthest from the camera. Or extreme wides where it's less obvious that they're not the same person because they're out of focus or whatever. We'll come back to body doubles, but first let's move on to masks. Masks are another option filmmakers have used that also don't require any other visual effects. In the film Being John Malkovich, director Spike Jones alternated body doubles and masks with the real John Malkovich throughout this whole bizarre Malkovich. Speaking of bizarre, who could forget the masks made for those Aphex Twin music videos? Wow. 
and the Matrix Revolution created over 50 masks for background extras, and they were in charge of operating 100 dummy heads for all the Agent Smith mannequins. They all have handles in the back, which are operated by one extra, operates two Hugos. It's also worth mentioning that many films have created masks for actors' stand-ins and stunt doubles. As the, the character Phil played, he kind of jumps up through these rafters and yeah. goes up. He was wearing as a stunt guy in a mask. And then, there's Arnold. Despite the fact that he's probably the most consistently cloned actor of all time. You know, you had the best celebrity lookalike I've ever seen. His stunt doubles, Billy Lucas and Peter Kent, went through several hours of makeup each day to apply a facial prosthetic to perform stunts like these. What's up, Billy? And for this shot specifically, for the Blu-ray, they've gone back and digitally replaced Peter's head with Arnold's. Now that's a visual effect. But before we get into those kind of examples, first we have to talk about the split screen. Now the split screen is pretty much as old as film editing itself. It's a compositing technique that allows you to stitch multiple clips together to show several images at once, where the line is either deliberately visible or by compositing elements from the same camera setup, creating one singular image where the line becomes invisible. And although there are great examples of stylized uses of split screen for juxtaposition and montage, we're gonna be focusing on the attempts to create the seamless split screen. The earliest example of this effect I can find was experimented with and pioneered by the French illusionist and filmmaker Georges Méliès, who used it on himself for many of his films at the turn of the century. Now this example here isn't technically a split screen, however the principle of combining multiple exposures to duplicate himself are on full display. As you can see, the men on the left gradually get darker as he keeps re-recording over the same strip of film. In order to avoid that, he experimented with cleverly splicing and cutting up the film in his other shorts. So what's actually happening to achieve this effect? Well, let's go back to the parent trap. What we would do on the optical printer is we would shoot two different exposures. One exposure would be the girl on the left with a mat blacking out the right side so no light hit the film. And then we would shoot a second exposure on the same film with the mat on the left side. The two strips of film were then re-photographed, one frame at a time, in a device called an optical printer. And now what you have is a complete scene. Get her talking about how she and Daddy first met and their first date. Find out about that first date. And that's more or less what audiences had grown accustomed to with film, often scanning the frame, looking for the line. Well done, Mr. Powers. Now there are several limitations to the split screen that filmmakers had to figure out. One of the main ones being character interaction. I just want to shake your hand. Will you shake my hand? Show me your hands, man. Characters couldn't really cross the line and physically interact with themselves. Let me show you. Often resulting in very stilted blocking. These were our parents. Look at them. If the characters do physically interact, you might see something like this, such as pushing a body double in an over-the-shoulder shot. Sit down. Now sit down! Now, of course, there are several exceptions and solutions to this that filmmakers have come up with over the years by creatively using body doubles in order to bridge that gap. Going back as far as the silent film era in 1922, Louis Stone shakes his own hand in The Prisoner of Zenda. Now, how cool is that? What's happening here is the stone on the right is shaking hands with the body double, and they've cleverly hid the split on the black sleeve of the other character's wardrobe. And in my opinion, it still holds up. Now let's jump forward 15 years to 1937 when they remade The Prisoner of Zenda, this time for sound. And we get these clever character interactions with both Ronald Coleman's. <laughs> well met, cousin. You must forgive me being unduly surprised. Handshakes as well as other physical contact. It's all right now, sire. You're safe. Cousin Rudolph. <laughs> All these were achieved by lining up Coleman's chest and torso with another body double. And under scrutiny, you can see the split. But upon first time viewing, it's still pretty impressive the thought that went into these shots. <laughs> well met, cousin! We can see these same techniques used again when Betty Davis plays opposite herself in A Stolen Life. Again, using body doubles to create this physical interaction. What a swell person you were, and what fun you'd had to get. Oh, 
As you can see, the split screen wasn't always just a hard line down the center of the frame. Intricate mats have been used to create all sorts of clever character interactions. Mwah! Now take a look at this shot in A Stolen Life. Here they use the edge of the chair to create the mat, so that Betty Davis could walk behind herself. As well as lining up her hand with a body double, she's then able to hand herself a match. Watch this. Why don't you go to Hyannis? The gang's all there. Not trying to get rid of me, are you? <laughs> don't be silly. Ugh, oh, I mean, come on. Now, it's easy to take for granted just how simple the act of walking around yourself could be. Especially if you're doing it without the help of any green screens or blue screens or anything. Take this shot from the 1970 film The Man Who Haunted Himself, where Roger Moore physically walked around himself. You made a mistake about that tie. I could have been seen wearing it, but didn't. And that suit. The city accepts certain conventions, you know. This might not be that impressive by today's standards. You've done this to me. Don't you see? But this is the earliest pre-digital example of a split-screen mask cutting around Roger Moore to accomplish just that. And again, it's not perfect, it's a little rough around the edges, but it's still a pretty incredible shot given the limitations of the split screen and what audiences had seen up to that point. Now the other huge limitation for this split screen effect for the longest time was camera movement. All these previous examples had been hindered by the fact that the camera was unable to move because the slightest movement would throw off the split. That's why when Alec Guinness played six roles in Kind Hearts and Cornets, this shot took two days to film and the camera operator reportedly slept next to the camera to make sure it didn't move. Now filmmakers have simulated camera movement for this effect, using rear projection for example. However, it wasn't until 1988 in David Cronenberg's Dead Ringers that a motion control camera rig was used to precisely replicate the camera movement in order to create the seamless split. Every twin shot must be filmed twice, with irons playing first one role and then the other. This was a motion control shot. We're seeing both halves of the frame. In this shot, we had the two of them walking side by side as the motion control rig was dollying back. And then we used the video to put a hard split in. We keep moving the split around to you know, accommodate them during the shot. While we're on the subject of camera movement, that same year Robert Zemeckis released Who Framed Roger Rabbit, where in the making of, he always wondered. There was a sort of rule that you can never move the camera when you're doing animation, which no one, I never understood who made up that rule. And action. And this is significant because like the limitations with the split screen, Zemeckis was never gonna allow any previous limitations of mixing live action and animation dictate how he was gonna tell the story. And while this film doesn't specifically contain the twin effect, several principles of using doubles allowed cartoon characters to interact with the physical world around them, as well as creatively designing specialized rigs that will later be animated over. Now pulling focus hadn't been done with animation like this before, so they had to figure it out. Jessica, for instance, who when she gets out of the car at the Maroon Studios and turns and looks up to the window, there's a focus pull, and if it wasn't there, the audience would say, oh, there's something wrong with this shot. Who Framed Roger Rabbit paved the way for Zemeckis to take all those tricks and techniques and apply them to his next project, Back to the Future Part Two, in what might very well be the high watermark in creating doubles with split screen composites. Now this film has it all, body doubles, character interaction, and like Roger Rabbit, Zemeckis was gonna move the camera wherever he needed it to to tell the story. So for this, they had to build their own motion control system. And keep in mind, this is all pre-digital. So let's go through it. You always did have a way with women. Get the hell out of my car, old man! One of the most subtle and brilliant moments, in my opinion, is this interaction right here. Stay down and shut up! Where Michael J. Fox removes the hat from Michael J. Fox. Oh, it's so good. That's a third actor's arm there that did that. Leaves the frame for just one frame or two and comes right back in and it is just yeah. seamless. There's a great moment where old Biff hands young Biff the sports almanac. All you gotta do is bet on the winner and you'll never lose. So, you know, he hands the book to himself and, you know, when we were previewing that movie, like somebody like cried out in the audience, how do they do that? <laughs> and I'll never, I'll ne and I just sat there and I thought, okay, mission accomplished. It's no simple task to hand an object across a split screen from combined takes with camera movement. 
So like in Roger Rabbit, a mechanical rig was designed to hold the book and do a precise handoff perfectly timed with the camera as it panned from right to left. All right, I'll, I'll take a look at it. And remember how they had to pull focus away from an animated character? Well, now they're pulling focus across the split screen. Marty, whatever happens, you must not let your other self see you. The consequences could be disastrous. Excuse me, sir. <clears throat> yes, you with the hat. Who? Me? Yes. Be a power, hand me a 5 8 inch wrench out of that toolbox. On the DVD, there's an extended scene featuring all three Michael J. Fox characters at a dinner table. Originally, it was meant to be one unbroken take, but they cut the scene way down because they felt it was too much of a gimmick. As cool as it is, that's really all that it is. It's not a scene that's about anything. It doesn't really advance the story or the characters. It's just a show-off shot that allows us to do that. I felt that this was an important lesson to keep in mind, that the effect should serve the story and not the other way around. Now before we move on, there's one other alternative to the split screen effect that's used throughout this series, and that's keying. This is simply filming an element against a green screen or a blue screen and keying out that color. Removing it so you can replace your background with whatever you want. Action! Several shots in part two were filmed against a blue screen to create the twin effect as well, where Michael J. Fox is in both the foreground and background elements. And some of this was done with the Vistaglide camera, and some of it was done blue screen. This, I believe, was blue screen. Of course, this wasn't the first movie to have used Keen for this effect. Now step inside and use your body. Like this. Relax, John. It's all part of the miracle of cloning. Hello, John. Hello, John. <laughs> Hello. Hello, John. Now, just because it's shot on green screen doesn't necessarily make it easier, and motion control is still generally used when there's camera movement. The real benefit is when you have characters overlapping or crossing in front and behind themselves. Harry, your eyesight really is awful. Now, Keen Film, before things went digital, had their own set of limitations in post-production, because there was only so much you could do to clean up the edges or to avoid subtle mistakes, such as a person accidentally walking through themselves. You see this guy, Tyson? This is where Ghost deserves an honorable mention here. Tell me, please, tell me! It creatively inverts the fact that this character can't interact with anything. Like for this shot here, they use a motion control rig as he attempts to stop the bad guy. Anyway, this was a turning point for visual effects. The final moment is film literally kissing a composite of digital video. <sighs> Where was I? Oh yes, digital. You ready? Wait! Once digital technology became available to filmmakers, the visual effects world entered a new era with infinite possibilities. As far as character interaction goes, we've come a long way from that first handshake. But the principles of using doubles hasn't changed. In order for Michael Keaton to hand himself this plate of food, they used a motion control camera and digitally composited a double's arm onto Michael Keaton's body. Ooh. The same technique was used again in Moon. Burning up. Sweat like a pig. Or depending on where the bottom of frame is, you can get away with things like this. I'm crazy! In this VFX breakdown, you can see how Jake Gyllenhaal's hand and arm are composited where they need to be, just below the frame. I'm crazy! Filmmakers are constantly coming up with creative ways to stage these kind of interactions. Check out this awesome shot from the City of Lost Children. Now the staging here is masterful. <laughs> Here in the behind the scenes, you can see that doubles and rough splits were used on set as reference. And because of the camera's position in relation to the action, the filmmakers were able to hide a cut between this frame of a double's arm making contact with Dominique Pinong's face, and the next frame it's gone for the follow through. But the motion happens so fast that digital compositors can make it all blend together seamlessly in the end. Pretty cool. And here's how they composited Chris Evans' head onto his stunt double. But Chris will come in and you'll have three cameras, and then from that footage you'll build the best angle 
And the trick is that you can't just stretch the actor's face to match the stunt double's head. So you end up having to like warp the stunt person's head <laughs> <laughs> to match Chris Evans' head and then put his face on it. Oh my gosh. Yeah, so easy. <laughs> Okay, so I briefly mentioned before how Peter Kent's head was digitally replaced with Arnold's for the Blu-ray. Well, we've reached a point where audiences are being fooled all over again. Unable to tell if what they're really looking at is an actor or their stunt double. So how did we get here? Well, let me quickly acknowledge how far we've come in terms of facial animation and performance capture. And bear with me because not all these examples are specifically related to the twin effect. However, the many advances in this technology over the years is still relevant. All right, Jurassic Park obviously gets a lot of attention for its revolutionary use of CGI to create the dinosaurs, but it's also one of the first films to digitally replace an actor's face. In this scene here, when Lex falls through the ceiling, her stunt double looks up at the camera. So for that split second, they composited Lex's face on top. The Crow is another early example of this effect. When actor Brandon Lee was accidentally killed during production, they used a body double and digital face replacement to complete the film, like for this shot here. When his father Bruce Lee passed away during production on Game of Death, they resorted to using a cardboard cutout of his face to complete the scene. Obviously technology has come a long way since then. Visual effects artists have been able to create human performances in the computer since the abyss. We can reconstruct the actor's face and digitize his expressions as you wish. Animate, model, create very realistic, very strong human faces. I have any idea how much that stings. And for many of these early digital effects, the animators were responsible for doing their best to recreate the actor's performance based off of a video reference but the same way they were able to use motion capture data created from an actor's body. Over time, they developed a way of capturing the nuanced movements of an actor's face. This is where we get performance captured films such as The Polar Express and Beowulf. Tell me! Do it! Tell me! Tell me! However, it wasn't until the effects team on Avatar developed a head rig with mounted camera specifically for capturing the facial performance. And this method has largely been used and adopted ever since to create an authentic performance for any kind of character. I was made for this. Then the animators are now able to use that actor's performance shot on set to create whatever kind of character they need to. This is not de-aging. This is not face replacement. But what you see for Junior is a completely digital creation, 100% driven by Will Smith's performance capture. 10 years from now, there, there will be court cases where people are like, I swear to God, that's not me. <laughs> it's honestly crazy just how far we've come. And with deep fake technology on the rise, who knows where we're headed? I'm in the zeitgeist. <laughs> Woo! So if you couldn't already tell, this is not the real Tom Cruise. It's actually a deep fake. And here's how he made it. Yeah, did I mention there were infinite possibilities? You should have gone for the head. This new era of facial capture and compositing is truly remarkable. And with this technology, filmmakers can mix and match both old and new methods for creating doubles. Like for this shot here, Fincher and his team digitally replaced Army's face onto Josh. You Mark Zuckerberg? Yeah. While this shot is blue screen. Or for moments like this that don't require any visual effects at all. Every freshman has issued one of these, and somewhere in this book it says you can't steal from another student. It's amazing how these tiny little things can put two people in the room. Like, you know, the fact that Tyler just throws the student handbook over to Cameron and Cameron snatches it out of there and walks away. These little stupid things just make them feel more like they're in the same room. There are so many creative ways filmmakers have used doubles to create doubles, to create interaction, move the camera, and continue to fool us when the effect itself becomes seamless. It was the greatest magic trick I've ever seen. Anyway, I hope this video has shed some insight into what I consider to be one of the most common visual effects of all time, that audiences will continue to see time and time again. And if you're interested in any more information on this topic, we'll provide links below for related articles, as well as the full VFX breakdowns featured in this video. All right, that's it for today. I'll talk to you next time.